Coming up on show 901, the Polestar 2 gets a surprising EPA range rating. Stick around, I'll tell you more. Plus, Mercedes-Benz reveal more models. Extreme E go testing, and Tesla finally gets more secure. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily for what happened on Tuesday, 6th of October. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. Thank you, as always, to myev.com for helping uh, to make the show. Now, if you're in the US and you're all about learning about EVs, maybe about selling, maybe about buying, maybe you're a dealer and you want more information or you just want to know what's out there at the minute, what the price is like, what's the used price like of a car that you might be selling or looking for, check out myev.com. So the Polestar 2 EPA range rating is out and some will find it surprising. The official range rating for the Polestar 2 in the US is 233 miles, which is 375 kilometers. Now, some find that surprising because it has a rather large battery, which is 78 kilowatt hours, although not all of that is usable. I'll get onto that in a minute. Uh, below our expectations, says Inside EV. Several months ago, Polestar's website showed a target range in the US of 275 miles rather than the 233 that it's actually been awarded. Uh, that's 442 kilometers. The target, the European WLTP rating is yet another set of figures. And here we start to get into the point of this story, which is what one do we really trust and how do buyers even know how far their car will go? Anyway, let me get on to that. WLTP is the test that the European system is, and that gives it 292 miles compared to 233 in the US or 470 kilometers. And the final EPA result is is always lower than WLTP, and there are always anomalies. Now, the biggest anomaly out there, yes, I'll mention it, is the Porsche Taycan, which was given a crazy low, 201, 203 miles of range by the EPA, which isn't anywhere near real life. But as soon as people started, no, first of all, the journalists got press cars, and they all went a lot further. Then people actually got their real Porsche Taycans, and they all went a lot further. So something weird happened there with the EPA testing. I've not ever heard of the EPA addressing the Porsche Taycan issue, but it's definitely massively, massively underselling it. Porsche even went so far as to commission all their own research to say, look, it goes a lot further. It's just blatantly wrong. The cars that do pretty well out of the EPA ratings would be like Tesla, but then Tesla owners and fans would go, well, that's because the cars, you know, do actually go further. So it's not a perfect science, but that boils down to the root of it, which is there is no perfect way to measure this. So sure, I think Polestar will be disappointed with 233. One of the things that I like to do, but that's this is not for regular buyers, but I like to have a look around at those people who do road tests that I trust, because every variable impacts the range, the speed you're driving at, the weather, the road surface, the temperature, whether you had air conditioning on, the PSI of the tyres, and a million other variables. And so it's really, really hard to do this. And also when you give a range, you know, some people will charge the car to 100% or it'll be on like 98, 99, and they'll get going. And then they'll drive it down to 50% and double it. Well, that's not the way that batteries work. And so what's the best way to do it? What, go to 100, drive it till you physically run out of energy and then have a recovery lorry pick you up? Well, probably the ultimate way of doing it, but massively inconvenient. Do it on a rolling road with no wind resistance, then add a formula like the EPA do. Well, sort of subtract the formula if you like. I don't know if there's any perfect way of doing it, but, but, but... Oh, one of the people that I do like to watch is B uh, Bjorn Nieland, who is a Norwegian YouTuber, and he took the Polestar 2 out on the 21st of August. It was 18 degrees outside on 19-inch tyres, and he did two tests. He does his 90 kilometer uh, per hour test and a 120 kilometer per hour test. At 90 kilometers an hour, it went 270 miles, so that is you know, less than WLTP, but more than EPA. That's 435 kilometers. And then he did the 75 mile an hour test, the 120 kilometer per hour test, and it did 189 miles or 305 kilometers. So again, a lot less than both, but again, 
Those tests don't take into account driving non-stop for hours at 75 miles an hour, or 120 k's. But you can compare his tests pretty reasonably, because he knows what he's doing with other cars like it. So the Model 3, for instance, he tested the Model 3 Performance. It was four degrees warmer, and it went with a, with a smaller battery, it must be said it went a lot further. So whereas the Polestar did 189 miles, Model 3 Performance did 243. So 54 miles further in a Model 3 with a smaller battery. Now, the Polestar 2 is heavier, but that doesn't explain everything. You need to start looking at the efficiency of the entire powertrain. So that's not just the motors, but the inverters and everything that goes inside the car. So there's multiple factors to add up here. Will the Polestar 2 go further in real life driving than the EPA range? Yes, it will. Now, I'm not dissing EPA. I think it's probably the most accurate out there at giving, trying to give a car a set of numbers. But I think Polestar will be disappointed by that. And the people that simply play the numbers game that look at a Model 3 or a Polestar 2 and realize there's such a big discrepancy between them will go, ah, oh, you know, it's just such a big difference for such an amount of money more but you make your mind up you decide personally i think the styling of the polestar is stunning the interior the the the, the i think the model 3 when you put the model 3 on its own is gorgeous and you put it next to a polestar no competition for no but that's personal taste that's entirely subjective uh, which is kind of pointless but it's my opinion the polestar 2 is just designed in a nicer way to suit my tastes but here i am in you know, Northern Europe, maybe tastes are different around the world, but there's got to be some reasons why, with a bigger battery, it doesn't go as far. And we'll probably never really know those. But maybe you'd call that a bad day for Polestar. I don't you know. If a car goes more than 200 miles, who cares? <laughs> you know, I know you're spending 60,000, but if a car goes more than that, you know what? It's, it, it, it's beyond bladder range. The thing that I've not seen anybody talk about today, and there's been loads of articles about the Polestar, is the Volvo XC40 Recharge, which is essentially the same technology with the Volvo badge on the front, Volvo interior, Volvo styling, SUV body. That's not going to go as far, I would, I would suggest, because it's a less aerodynamic shape. But otherwise... It's very similar to the Polestar 2, so uh, we'll wait and see. That hasn't got an EPA range yet, but the US website for Volvo XC40 Recharge says uh, a projected range of up to 208 miles. Again, a lot of money, 60 grand for a car that just squeezes over 200 miles on the EPA test. There's going to need to be some education of buyers because people are going to just, if you just look at a piece of paper and the numbers, that doesn't tell the whole story. All right, if you thought that was a bad day for Polestar, maybe the day gets a little bit worse because Polestar 2s have had to be recalled in Europe and China uh, because of an issue affecting cars shutting off and not restarting. Now, this is, does not cause a safety issue. Okay, the car does turn itself off, but the steering works, the brakes still work. You can pull over safely but clearly that's less optimal. Um, the recall doesn't affect any cars in North America because there aren't any, says Green Car Reports. After customers reported the issue, uh, Polestar, the company from Volvo and Geely, started recalling cars. Now, all of them have to go back. 2,200 cars are currently in customers' hands, but they will all be going back for a software update. Polestar said, and I quote, we issued a voluntary safety recall for Polestar 2 after we investigated, verified, and developed a solution for an issue reported by a small number of customers, end quote. I'll pop a link in the show notes if you would like to read more. Uh, Mercedes-Benz came out today. Next in the news, Mercedes-Benz have got three new EQ models confirmed today in an investor conference call. And they have been designed around a new electric vehicle architecture. Uh, it is the structure that underpins the upcoming EQS which is the luxury saloon, and it's undergoing the final phase of testing all around the world, uh, says Autocar Magazine. During the conference, Mercedes released a marketing video of prototype versions of the EQS saloon, the EQS SUV, and the EQE saloon. 
and they're doing testing right now in the Black Forest in Germany. In the video, Mercedes Vice President of EVs and EQ Vehicles, Christoph Starzinski, uh, described the EQE Saloon, which is coming in 2022, as a business limousine of the future uh, that's slightly smaller than the EQS. Mercedes says its new entry-level EQ model, which is the EQA, will be in production before the end of the year, which is a positive piece of news. Uh, Mercedes are a company like BMW who have the impossible task of navigating their way to an electric future. And this is beyond, beyond difficult um, because they have so many investors who are every three months wanting to know, what am I getting back in this? And you have you have competition like startups in the uh, typically American but Chinese startups as well who can who are coming from nothing and don't have all of those factories and staff and unions and pensions and responsibilities frankly to their employees and the families of those employees uh, to keep them in jobs and to keep the companies making money but at some point some people have the theory that these legacy companies are going to have to take a hit for three or five years and just lose a ton of money and completely pivot to EVs. But of course, if you're a manager at that company, even at the very top, maybe you are incentivized in your pay structure to hit certain share price targets or volume targets, but maybe they're quite short term. It's hard to look past, you know, your own paying your own mortgage to put a company through incredible pain to move to EV. It's an impossible task for all of the, you know, we call them the legacy OEMs, and that it always sounds like I'm doing them a bit of a disservice or slightly, you know, favouring sexy new startups, but it is so difficult. Um, so Mercedes are trying to navigate that. I'm not sure they're doing the world's best job of it, considering the the time they've had to do to, to get to this point, but there we go. The EQA is going to be the baby one. That's like a GLA. There's the EQB, an electric B-Class. There's the EQE, which is an E-Class piece of pure luxury. Um, there's going to be an SUV version of that, like the GLE. Now, you can't simply take the saloon version and make it bigger, as it were, uh, more akin to, like, Model S, Model X, if you like. But there's going to be an SUV version of that. Uh, there's the EQS, which is like an S-Class, and an SUV version of that, like a GLS. And there is the EQV van on sale now, starting at £70,000. I'll say it again. The EQV starting at £70,000 for the van. And I'll pop a link to Autocar in the show notes if you want to read more. I love racing. I love electric racing. There's going to be so much more of it in the future as well. A number of high-profile drivers from every walk of motorsport life got a taste of Extreme E for a six-day test recently. Uh, drivers from the world of sports cars, Formula One, Formula E, and Rally uh, were on hand to test out the new vehicle, which is going to be racing in Extreme E, the Odyssey 21. The list of drivers was kept quiet, but some people did post on their Instagram accounts, so we know that Valtteri Bottas from Formula One, Mercedes, was part of the drivers trying out the new Extreme E cars. According to Jalopnik, reports indicating some WRC and World Rallycross drivers took part as well. Among the drivers who did participate were the uh, series co-founder and team owner Jean-Éric Verne from Formula E and the double amputee racing driver Billy Munger and confirmed Andretti United Autosport driver Timmy Hansen. I love me some World Rallycross. I know that they burn things and they're very loud and very combustion-y, but if you get a chance to watch uh, World Rallycross, it's so good. It's so good. Make it electric as quick as possible. Ken Block uh, did a bit of a demonstration run uh, they, when they got racing after COVID ended. A uh, month ago, six weeks ago, Ken Block took out uh, actually, they did race with three cars in, uh, and it was good. Not quite there yet. Uh, and I agree, the sound matters. As a racing fan, the sound matters. I'm, I'm not here to just promote everything EV blindly. Like, that, for some people, and probably me included, the difference between those rallycross cars and the electric ones it is a different experience. But I can't wait. The series is going electric either... No, I think they moved it back, 2022. And... Can't wait. It's just going to be so much fun. So much instant talk available. Oh, man. Looking forward to that. Uh, Tesla. Got some stories today for Tesla finally launching two-factor authentication. If you know what that is, it's a slightly geeky term for making sure that hackers don't nobble all your details. Uh, Tesla finally launching its 2FA feature 
to secure their accounts. As Electric, Elon Musk has been talking about implementing this for ages now. Earlier this year, he said it was coming soon and it was an embarrassing delay. And now Tesla has officially released their two-factor authentication feature to owners. You know what this is? This is where you get uh, you log into something and then it sends you a text message with a code. Or even better, uses an app on your phone to authenticate the your identity and i changed my iphone a couple of weeks ago and forgot to transfer those things over and i use i tend to use the LastPass and the google one and yes it was a faff calling my mortgage mortgage company and then wanting to know every possible piece of information out of me inside leg measurement sir i don't know what that password was but look it's your mortgage you want it to be secure and not have a randomer call the bank and pretend to be you but still Still, it's a bit of a faff when it goes wrong, but that's the price to pay for security, and especially for Tesla owners who might use their same email address to log into their account as they do everywhere else. So many data breaches have happened. So many people use common or weak passwords. You do not want somebody getting into your Tesla account, registering an app, and all of a sudden driving away with your car because they've summoned it. Um, Yeah, exactly, right? You need two-factor authentication on uh, your Teslas. A user online called Haggy explained more. Once you set it up, both the app and the web access need the code from your app on your phone. Uh, But you can add a second device. If you have multiple drivers or devices, when it asks you for the code, it'll ask you which of the devices you want to get the code from, and that's good. But if you have more than two drivers then you have to set up multi-factor authentication for each one with different email addresses. And it's a pain because they say the way Tesla do it, unlike other websites where they'll remember you for 28 days or 30 days on the same device, with Tesla you have to enter it every single time. Not to drive the car, by the way. Let me explain. You can still use the pin to drive the car. This is to get into your Tesla account, which will do just about everything if you can access someone's tesla account online in terms of app access and things like that access to the car and things like that and functions of the car so this is one account you do do want totally secure well during battery day tesla unveiled a completely new battery the 4680 form factor which people called the biscuit tin which is ridiculous. It's more like the tin of beans. Um, it's much smaller than a, than a biscuit tin, but it is bigger than the kind of batteries they're using at the moment. And they're going to use those that they want to make a, they have a pilot plant now uh, in California making these new cells. This time next year, they want to be making 10 gigawatt hours of these cells every single year. That's going to be the annualized rate uh, in a year's time. But what do you do with all of it? I mean, it's a pilot line. It's a pilot plant. But you can't simply recycle all of them. You can't simply think, oh, you know, we we just made a thousand of those batteries. They're pretty good. Run them again. So they've got to put the the ones that pass the test, they've got to do something with it. Turns out they're going to be putting them inside the Model S. The Model S Plaid Edition, which is coming out at the end of next year, will use these new first 4680 batteries uh, cells from Tesla, which Elon Musk confirmed to a question asked to him on Twitter, of course. Uh, Model S Plaid Model 520 miles plus, uh, 0 to 60 less than two seconds. Other vague numbers were pulled out of Elon's backside at that event. There was nothing specific because they didn't want to fall under Lucid's numbers. So they simply said, oh, you know, further than this and quicker than that, but not being very specific, which was clear. It's what I would have done. It's very clever. Whereas Lucid, their biggest competition in terms of those things, actually have to give those numbers and, and are slightly behind. So therefore, everybody, you know, the Tesla the Tesla hardcore nutters can go, oh, I think you'll find uh, my favourite car company is quicker, which does make them feel better because they all live with their mums. So let's talk about MG. Uh, Britain's fastest growing car brand is rapidly expanding uh, their EV Mark with the best ever month in September. Uh, 3,668 MG sold in the UK, and a third of those were the electric version of the MG ZS EV, uh, a car that certainly uh, gives you a lot for your money. MG launches two new electrified models this month. There's the all electric MG5, which is an estate, and I really want one, not because I want an MG, but because I want an estate EV, because it's the first one. 
I love estate cars. So practical. And I don't want an SUV. Uh, but they are also launching a plug-in, which is the MGHS. So we'll see by the end of the year if there is an MG5 estate car on my driveway. Not particularly because I'm in love with MGs, just because it's the perfect car for me. Uh, and putting in baby stuff in the back of it. Final story to mention Lucid a moment ago. Uh, Lucid Motors announced the opening of their Beverly Hill Studio and Service Centre, uh, representing the company's second retail location and one of 20 Lucid Studios that will open throughout North America by the end of 2021. Having recently unveiled the Lucid Air Dream Edition, which starts production early next year, the car takes centre stage at the Beverly Hill Studio. Lucid's virtual reality experience combines the physical and the virtual world, so you can put the headset on and design the car exactly how you want and if you've not spent any time in VR which I have done recently uh, with the latest oculus stuff oh my goodness it's crazy crazy good it's so realistic and I think this is what they're using as well in their design studios and so if you ever get a chance to do it, just just try it and it will freak out your brain. Um, the latest VR is incredibly good. It feels like you are sitting inside the car. You can change the colours of everything and it just looks so cool and so realistic. Well, that's your show for today. Thank you for listening. If you want to get in contact, you can do on Twitter and on email. And I would love to have a chat with you. If you can do one thing after listening to this podcast. what If you could share it with one other person, I mean, look, share it with more, feel free. Uh, but if you could, with at least one other person, it'll help me grow this podcast and it gets bigger all the time, but I'm just, I'm greedy, you know? I want to tell more people about the brilliant cars and the amazing EVs that are coming and are on the market now and I can only do that with your help. So please, you know, if you listen every day, if you can spread the word and just tell somebody about the podcast, it'll really help me out. Thank you to our premium patron partners, Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, Porsche of The Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, NationalCarCharging.com and AlohaCharge.com, Derek Riley of the EV Review Ireland YouTube channel and Richard at rsimons.co.uk R-S-Y-M-O-N-S The Electric Vehicle Specialists Have a wonderful day, I'll catch you tomorrow And remember there's no such thing As a self-charging hybrid